Hello! <laughs> so, let's talk about part one of Nona the Ninth, or day one, I suppose, as it's called in the book. Um, so, not a ton happens in this section. I Really, there still really isn't any plot going on at this point. So, I have no way of predicting where this is going. Um, so... I also don't have much to say about what happens here, because, again, nothing actually happens here. Uh, but that doesn't mean I don't love this section. In fact, I think this is my favorite opening to any one of these books so far. Um, by the way, for those who are new here, uh, full spoilers for this section uh, and all previous books going forward from this moment on. Um, I will be spoiling everything that happens in the section that I read. Um, so, uh, we have a really surprising setup here. So I knew, we knew from the end of the previous book that whoever Nona is, like from the epilogue of the previous book, we knew that whoever Nona is, she's living with Camilla and two other people. That's what was established at the end of the previous book. And she's living in a place that feels a lot more like just normal human world than anything else we've seen so far in the Lock Two. And this book kind of throws us headfirst into that with a bunch of things that massively recontextualize that information that I just gave. So first of all, the other two people that uh, Nona is living with, in addition to Camilla, are Pyra, who is in the body of Gideon the First, um, and Palamedes, who is sharing Camilla's body with Camilla. Which is so much already. Like, just those two facts are incomprehensible. Uh, like, we knew Pyra was around uh, in Gideon's body. How she ended up here, we still don't quite know. We knew Camilla was around, and we knew Palamedes' ghost was around. Uh, the fact that he's living in Camilla's body is new. And the fact that they're all raising a child together is exceptionally new. Especially when we get into the discussion of that child's identity, which we will get to in a moment. Um, but the first thing I noticed about this is that while technically, technically, Pyra, Camilla, and Palamedes are all, as far as we know, cis characters. They are now the world's most trans cis characters who have ever existed, because we have Palamedes, who is sharing part-time the body of a woman, and we have uh, Pyra, who is literally living inside the body of her male best friend. Um, there's a lot of gender stuff going on with these characters, which I really appreciate. I really like the fact, and I like the fact that it's not made a big deal out of. It's just like, like, it's just there. You're, we're just presented with this situation which, in the hands of other writers, might have been used to, like, make a big deal out of it, to, like, make a story about how weird or uh, wrong or messed up this whole thing is. But no, uh, no, uh, Tamsin Muir does not think this is a problem. As far as Tamsin Weir is concerned, uh, the fact that these people are 
living in each other's bodies and living in bodies that are of a different sex than their original bodies. And it, it's basically never brought up and it doesn't seem to concern anyone involved. Uh, obviously it doesn't concern Nona because she's, she, this is all she knows, but it also doesn't concern uh, Pyra or Palamedes themselves as far as we can tell. Uh, there's no indication that they're particularly troubled by this, by that by that aspect of the situation. They are troubled by many other aspects of the situation, though, um, as we'll get to. But I really like that. Uh, I like that. Um, I, I I I like the way it's sort of ca like casual gender fuckery going on with these characters. Um, which is something that we haven't gotten a ton of in previous books. Like, previous books have had a, ton, uh, a ton of very casual sort of messing about with sexuality, but not really with gender. Now we're getting some more gender stuff in this book, which I enjoy. Um, but, that's all irrelevant next to the question of Nona's identity. So, here's what I'm like, 90% confident of so far. Nona's body is Harrow's body. Like, this is, this is Harrow, this is Harrow Hark Nonagesimus. That is the body that is now living under the name Nona. Her eyes are Gideon's eyes, by which I mean Gideon and Av, not Gideon the first. <sighs> so her eyes, she has Gideon's eyes in Harrow's body. She does not have either of their memories or either of their personalities. She is, she appears to be a brand new persona inhabiting Harrow's body. Um... Based on what occurred at the end of the previous book, my guesses would be either that Nona is some kind of full-on fusion of the personalities and minds of Harrow and Gideon, and that the act of fusing their minds basically wiped both of their personalities out and created a new person. That's one option. The other option is that she's not either of them. That she's like a brand new personality that has been created within this body in the absence of Harrow or Gideon from the body. Because... The last book ended in a really weird way. Um, Gideon's narration ended with her seeming to state that she died again. And Harrow's narration ended with her inside her own mind palace going to a simulacrum of the locked tomb and lying inside the empty coffin with Gideon's sword. And I have no idea what that was supposed to signify exactly, <laughs> but it was clearly meant to be, based on the previous conversation she had with Dulcinea, it was meant to be some kind of way for Harrow to essentially try to preserve both herself and Gideon. Uh, to basically reject having to make the choice between herself and Gideon that was presented to her by Abigail. Um, so, I don't know what she did, but whatever she did clearly created Nona in some capacity. Whether Nona is made up of Harrow or Gideon or both or neither, I can't really tell. Mm. One thing that is noteworthy, however, is that when when Nona is talking to um, Camilla at the near the end of this section, she asks her, "What did you think about me when you first saw me?" And Camilla says, 
I thought I didn't know you at all. You were new. To which Nona in her head tells us that she had always loved this answer unreasonably. The idea that that was when Camilla met her. That was her birth. So on some level, subconsciously perhaps, Nona finds it really important that she is new. She does not want to have continuity with either Hero or Gideon, I think. She wants to be something else. And I presume that the reason she wants that is because on some subconscious level, whoever she is, whether Harrow or Gideon or a combination of both or some third entity, also wants that for more clear reasons that, we'll event that we will eventually learn. Um, and that kind of, honestly, that would mesh with both Harrow and Gideon, because both Harrow and Gideon are well known for having not the best opinion of their own existences and their own lives. Uh, um, I can easily imagine either of them wanting to no longer be who they are, wanting to be new, to be someone completely new. So that doesn't really narrow it down, but it is an interesting line. Um... On the topic of Nona's identity, probably one of one of my favorite, like, really subtle jokes in this series so far is when um, when Palamedes asks Nona why she likes Coronabeth. Nona lists a bunch of stuff about Coronabeth that she likes, and one of the things she lists is her breasts. And Palamedes immediately reacts by, like, jotting something down on his notepad. And Nona says that whenever she mentions breasts, Palamedes, like, immediately makes a note. Um, and I absolutely adore that because the obvious implication, at least to me, is that Palamedes has, like, a little chart where he notes down, like ticks in favor of her being Harrow and ticks in favor of her being Gideon. And whenever she mentions boobs, she gets a tick in the Gideon line. At least, that's the only way I can see to interpret that. It's really funny. I love it. Palamedes is just like, hmm, that sounds like something only Gideon would say. I, I, I love that. Um, I also have a note here from the moment when I realized that Nona was some combination of Harrow and Gideon or something. And the, and the note is, in all caps, God damn it, Muir, you can't keep pretending every book is a new POV and then just have it be Gideon again. Uh... I, I, for that reason alone, I hope it turns out Nona is Gideon, because I think it would be really funny for the third book in a row to just be Gideon's POV again, like, secretly all along, the way that Hero ended up being mostly Gideon's POV, uh, in hindsight. Um, yeah, I, I, I really like that. Um, what else is going on here. So another thing that's going on is Nona has like a weird magical language power that lets her know every language and unless I'm forgetting something that has absolutely nothing to do with Hero or Gideon. Like neither Hero nor Gideon have any kind of particular language ability unless I'm again forgetting something. Um, so that is maybe an indication in favor of the theory that Nona is something else entirely and is not, in fact, Harrow or Gideon or any combination thereof. 
Um, it also raises an interesting question, which is that Corona Beth is not referred to as Corona Beth at any point in this book. I am calling her Corona Beth because it's obviously her, but the name actually used to refer to her is Crown. And when I first saw that, my assumption was that this was a very unimaginative code name that they were using to talk about her without identifying her, because they're clearly in a somewhat covert situation where they're kind of hiding from Blood of Eden. Um, and also from the houses. But on second thought, I think that's less likely. I think what's actually happening is that Palamedes and Camilla and Pyra are calling her Corona, and because Corona is a word with which means crown, it's a Latin word which means crown, Nona's brain is automatically translating that to crown, and that's why Nona calls her crown. That actually seems likelier than that being a code name, because it would be a really shit code name, because it's just her name, but translated. Um, if, if I'm right about that, that's a pretty cool detail and pretty subtle. Um... And then we have the question of where the hell they are. So it's still not entirely clear what happened to the nine houses, or eight houses, I guess, when John briefly died in the last book. Everyone seemed to believe that at least the houses that were closest to the sun were wiped out. And maybe all of them were, but I'm assuming not. I'm assuming, I'm assuming the ninth house at least still physically exists. Um, I doubt the sun expanded that far. Um, so where they are now is not in the Dominicus system. It's not in the system of the nine houses. It's somewhere else in John's empire, presumably. And it's a planet which has been largely, or maybe uh, a satellite, which has been largely taken over by Blood of Eden. Although there's still active fighting going on. Like, there's a group of, um, a group of the cohort here who's, like, trapped in an armory, I believe. Like, currently under siege. But most of the planet seems to be, seems to belong to Blood of Eden, from what I can tell. It's very hard to pick up, because Nona is... Nona's POV is very unreliable because she has, like, a very childlike way of thinking and doesn't really take the whole political situation very seriously and doesn't pay a lot of attention to it. But from what I've been able to gather, Blood of Eden controls this planet, even though there's still, like, there's still, they still haven't, like, fully taken it. There's still resistance from the cohort. Um, they've installed some kind of thing in the sky that, like, burns necromancers, and Palamedes is safe because he's in a non-necromantic body. Like, Camilla's body protects Palamedes. And Pyra is safe because even though she's in a necromantic body, she herself is not a necromancer. Which seems to imply that whatever this thing e is can only target you if both your body and your soul are necromantic. I guess. Either that or Pyra is protected by being a lictor. That's also possible. But the implication seems to be that your body and your soul need to both be necromantic. Which raises an interesting issue for Nona. Because Nona is in a necromancer's body. She's in Harrow's body. But she herself, whoever she is, is not a necromancer. They keep trying to get her to do necromancy, and she clearly can't. She does not have the affinity for it. She can't even sense when other people are doing it. Um, so, that seems to indicate that 
she might not be Hero, that she might be Gideon. Although it's also possible that Hero, like, essentially de 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 necromancered herself somehow, maybe? Like, lost access to her abilities? Or, again, Nona is, like, a third person entirely. One possibility, of course, uh, which I haven't mentioned, is that Nona is in some way A.L. Um, I, I can't remember what we what A.L. ended up being short for. It wasn't Annabelle Lee. That was like a nickname. I can't remember what the actual name was. Did we learn the actual name? I think we learned the actual name. Um, anyway, uh, John's, uh, John's Cavalier. Uh, because obviously by virtue of being John's cavalier, she wouldn't have been a necromancer. And it would explain why Nona has golden eyes as well. Um, because those would then be John's eyes, because John and his cavalier swapped eye colors. when when they went through the whole Lichterhood process together. Um, so yeah, that's, that's also a possibility. Uh, the eye thing is interesting, actually, because in the previous book, it was established that when you go through the Lichterhood process, you and your cavalier, uh, or rather, you get your cavalier's eyes. And in John's unique case, where the Cavalier survived, she also got his eyes. Um, but in most cases, it's just the Necromancer gets the Cavalier's eyes. Now, Harrow, from what I remember, did not get Gideon's eyes until the end of the book, when she... When, when, when Gideon took over her body. And that's because Gideon's soul wasn't actually fused to Harrow's. It was, it was still a completely discrete entity. And we learn from this book something very strange about Palamedes and Camilla, which is that when Camilla is in control of her own body, she has Palamedes' eyes. And when Palamedes is in control of Camilla's body, he has Camilla's eyes? Which, weirdly enough, means that when Camilla looks fully like herself is specifically when she is not herself. Which is interesting. Um, because that seems to imply that Palamedes and Camilla have gone through some kind of essentially Lichterhood process where they've swapped their eyes, um, but they haven't, they don't have two bodies, they only have one body, but, and the body doesn't change depending on who's controlling it, but the eyes do. Which would imply that in a situation like Gideon and Harrow's, where they're both sharing one body, it would actually be when Harrow is in control that the body should have Gideon's eyes. But that's not what we saw in the previous book. We saw the opposite. When Gideon was in control, the body had her eyes. So I don't know if I'm reading too much into this. I don't know if this is a retcon or a plot hole, or if I just misinterpreted what was said here about Palamedes and Camilla. Um, so I'm not going to read too much into it, because I don't know if I'm even right about the basic facts. I'm just putting out there that I am constantly thinking about the eyes, and I am very confused about what is going on there. Uh, I also keep thinking about the possibility that, that Nona isn't even Harrow's body at all, and that that's a red herring, that we're supposed to think that she's Harrow's body, but that she's actually A.L., like, fully A.L., like, 
her body and her soul, like, completely unrelated to Gideon or Hero somehow? Maybe? I don't know. There's a lot going on here, and I am... My brain is soup. Uh, so let's talk about something else. Um, there are these weird intermission sections where we get John telling the story of what happened, how life on Earth ended, how this whole setting came to be. Um, telling that story to apparently Harrow, like he keeps calling her Harrow, the person he's talking to. Um, but he also seems to be saying that the person he's talking to, Harrow, was involved in the end of the in the end of the world, like that she was a major player somehow. She uh, she was the way they talk about it, it kind of sounds like she had some kind of disease that was going to destroy the world and they were trying to cure it, stop it, do something to it. I'm not sure. It's very weird. Um, I, I don't know what to make of those at all. Like, out of every, out of every already extremely confusing thing in this book, those little intermission chapters are by far the most confusing. Um, anyway, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that just the way this is written really appeals to me. Nona is just a delightful point of view character, and I am enjoying reading her, honestly, more than I ever enjoyed Gideon or Harrow. I, I liked Gideon and Harrow both as point of view characters, but Nona is just such a delightful breath of fresh air. There's such a mixture of, like, this, like, innocent directness and literal-mindedness to her, but then also... Sometimes the way she thinks is super indirect and super, like, like there's so much depth to it and you can read meaning into it a lot. I just really enjoy it. It's, it's, it's a really, really, really appealing uh, narrative voice to use for this book. Um... The, uh, let's see, some other minor notes I have. Um, Nona's relationship with the other kids is great, and I hope nothing happens to the kids, even though I'm sure it will, because we can't have nice things in locked tomb books. It always ends in tragedy. Um, but I really like the kids, and I hope they're safe. Um, next, Palamedes convinced the sixth house to break from the empire maybe like the entire sixth house if i understood that correctly and now they've lost them like they, they don't know where the sixth house is there's talk of trying to find the sixth house huh what? Um, oh, by the way, speaking of the sixth house, I did read the study of Dr. Sex, the, the free short story on Tor, on, on Tor Books' website, which is about uh, Palamedes and Camilla as kids in the sixth house. Uh, I don't have many thoughts on that story as of yet. Um... But I do, but as a result of that story, I do have a bit more of a personal connection with the sixth house than I do with some of the other houses, because we, because you know, I've I've read a little bit of a narrative set there. Um, so I'm glad that they're alive. I'm glad that that house seems to have survived. Um, yeah, I think. I think that's all I have to say. This was maybe the most chaotic and unorganized video I've ever made, but that's because of the nature of this book. It's just nothing happened, and yet there's so much. There's so much to talk about in this one tiny section. Um, 
yeah, see you next week for day two, I guess. <laughs> Help. Help.